Luis. Um, my, there we go. We've got the AV support coming online. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you for our public seminar, which we are running as a hybrid, hybrid event today. So I think we're expecting about 50 people in the audience. And if I understand correctly, we have 250 people in the Zoom room. So welcome, welcome to you all. It's my great honour to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which the Garvin Institute and the St Vincent's Health and Innovation Precinct are located. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the founders of the Garvin Institute, the Sisters of Charity, incredible order of nuns that came up with the idea for the Garvin Institute more than 60 years ago today. We're going to hear from one of our most talented, brilliant female scientists this morning. Very excited to have you, Christine. Thank you so much. And we're talking about breast cancer. And as many of you will know, over the years, with thanks to significant investment in medical research, the survival rates for cancers, and in particular for breast cancer, have increased dramatically. So today, with thanks to investment in medical research and participation of patients in clinical trials, an average individual diagnosed with cancer, let's use breast cancer as the example, will have a overall five-year survival rate of 90%. And that is incredible. But unfortunately, there are a number of individuals, about 12%, I believe, who will be diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. And for triple negative breast cancer, and particularly triple negative that has already metastasized to other sites, the survival rate is an appalling 12% over five years. And that's one of the reasons why here at Garvin, we're focused on triple negative breast cancer as one of the cancers currently suffering unmet need with targeted precision medicine treatments. So we're very excited to talk to you about that today. Associate Professor Christine Chaffer leads the Cell Plasticity Laboratory at the Garvin Institute within the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and is also the co-lead of our strategic program for precision cancer medicine. Christine's going to talk to us about an innovative clinical trial that she has independently, with her brilliant team, put together in order to offer a new potential treatment for triple negative breast cancer. And this is in the clinic right now with, uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at St Vincent's Hospital, which is terribly exciting to go from a research discovery right into the clinic and test the efficacy of this particular treatment. In terms of housekeeping, we're going to have a fabulous presentation from Christine, followed by the opportunity for a Q&A. Those of you in the room this morning, the team will have handheld mics. Um, please don't be shy with any of your questions. And for those of you in the Zoom room, there'll be a Q&A function activated to which you can enter your questions and we'll do our best to respond to those. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Associate Professor Christine Schaffer. Thank you, Christine. I'm going to do a little bit of an icebreaker for Christine before she, not that she needs it, she's a brilliant presenter. So medical research is a hard slog. I think everyone knows that it takes years, it takes resilience, it takes determination. How do you keep your momentum and passion and keep your team excited about these big um, fundamental biological challenges? Yeah, so I guess the... The motivation is really wanting to help patients and we get excited when we have a really small experiment work because sometimes they don't and often they don't and then we get even more excited on days like today when we can share really good news of being able to take some of that basic research all the way through to the clinic so that keeps us going uh, it's the people amazing tell us about it over to you we'll do thank you thanks mara jean Thank you to everyone in the room. Great to see you here, and especially thanks to all the people online. I'm very happy that you can join us today. 
So I'd like to talk about a new therapy and a new strategy to treat cancer. And as you'll uh, see today, this is not just a treatment strategy for triple negative breast cancer. We have much bigger aspirations. We hope that the inroads we've made here for triple negative breast cancer will able to be extended to other types of cancer as well. So just quickly, disclosure, I am the uh, founder and managing director of a company that is developing one of the drugs that I'm going to talk to you about today, Sevaterinol. So cancer. What we, when we think about cancer, we think about this as cancer cells residing on a landscape. And so this means that there are different types of cancer cells within a tumour. They're not all the same. And we know that there are some cells that are poorly aggressive. So they're still cancer cells. But when we think about their ability to spread around the body, they're not as aggressive as other cells within the tumour. So what we do know is that there's a subpopulation of cells. We call these uh, cancer stem cells or CSCs. And these cells are often very rare within a tumour, but these are the cells that have the ability to spread and create tumours in different sites of the body. And so what my previous work and the work that's ongoing in my lab has discovered is that the cancer cells are not locked in one particular state. They actually have the ability to move across the landscape so they can change who they are. So even though a cancer cell might start out as being non-aggressive, we know that in response to certain stimuli or changes in the body, that they can actually move into a more aggressive state. But similarly, the cells that are aggressive, they can also change. So we also know that we can move them back across the landscape and into a less aggressive state. And the reason why this is important is because these are different types of cancer cells have different properties. And so by that I mean the cells that we know are less aggressive, these ones are also sensitive to chemotherapy. So this is a really good thing. But we also know that the cells that sit in this cancer stem cell state on this side of the landscape, these are generally not sensitive to chemotherapy. And so these are the cells that create problems because they're not treated by chemotherapy and they have all that power and ability to move around the body and create new tumours. And so what we were trying to do is understand how we can get rid of these cells but also one of the strategies could be to move them back across the landscape and into this state where they're going to be sensitive to the current therapies because chemotherapy, when it works, it works really well. But here's another one of the not so good things about chemotherapy. When there are tumors where these cells have the ability to move from one side to the other of this landscape, these tumours, sometimes when they're treated with chemotherapy, take advantage of that as an escape mechanism. And so this means that these cells that were non-aggressive, instead of dying in response to the chemotherapy, they can actually be pushed to the other side of the landscape. And this means now they've actually been pushed into a state that's not sensitive to the chemotherapy anymore. And so we've been really focused on understanding how we can stop this movement across the landscape we want to keep the cells here and we want to keep them sensitive to chemotherapy. And if we can do this, we really think that we can get better outcomes for patients. And this, as I mentioned at the start, this is not a strategy that's specific to breast cancer. We really believe that by understanding the mechanisms of controlling cells in different states, that we can then apply this to all tumour types. And the other really exciting part of this whole strategy is that these movements across the landscape are driven by pathways that we can discover. So if we can understand how they move, then we can create drugs to target them. So here's a scientific experiment. And this is something that, uh, a process that we would do very routinely in the lab. And so it really starts with this idea of taking a breast tumour. And we can um, see that there are many different types of cells within the tumour. And here we can use a process called fax, which is not a machine that is used to translate papers from one side to the other. It actually enables us to separate out cells. And so what we can do here, each little dot here is a cell. And the orange ones represent the cells that are really aggressive within the tumour. And the blue ones are the less aggressive cells. And so by using fax, we can cell sort these populations into the orange and the blue and into many other subpopulations as well. 
And then we can look at what's inside these cells. And then we can look at the differences. And by looking at the differences between these cells, we can start to understand what's driving the cells into that aggressive state. And can we find a way to target them? And so we did this process, and this was work led by a postdoc, Beatrice perez Salman, in my lab. And we discovered that the androgen receptor, denoted here by AR, is a protein that is really highly expressed in the aggressive cells within a cancer. And so we thought, maybe if we try to target and disrupt the androgen receptor, we might be able to change where the cells are sitting on that landscape. So androgen receptor is common throughout the body. You might have heard of it. It's a receptor that responds to the hormone testosterone. So when testosterone comes into the cell, it binds to the androgen receptor, and then the androgen receptor travels into the nucleus of the cell, and there it regulates proliferation of cells, so their growth of the cells and their survival. And so in the cancer setting, this is not something we want. We do not want the cells to be proliferating. We certainly don't want them to be surviving. So what we did in the lab was to look at different types of drugs that target the androgen receptor. And these are actually used in the clinic to treat uh, diseases like prostate cancer. But they haven't been used successfully to treat breast cancer yet. So what we did, and here's an example, was to take... Uh, those aggressive cells within the tumour. And here's an experiment where you can see these tiny little balls. These are actually almost like little tumour organoids that we can grow in the lab. And it's a way for us to study the disease outside of the body. And this ability to grow into a little tumour like this in the dish is something that's unique to the cancer stem cell population, so those aggressive cells. And so under normal conditions, these... Um, aggressive cells will grow little balls. And we asked, if we treat these cells with drugs that inhibit the androgen receptor, can we get rid of those aggressive cells in the body? And so here you can see we've used three different drugs, sevoterinol, enzalutamide, and abiraterone. And in all of these cases, you can see, especially with the drug sevoterinol, that these balls get eradicated. And so this is really a great outcome. And this is just a, a quantification here. You can see that all of these androgen receptor inhibitors decrease the ability of these cells to grow tumours in, in the dish, but that sevoterinol was the best drug at doing this. So one of the other things that we wanted to look at was this idea of the cells moving across the landscape. Do you remember the, the landscape picture when we treated with the chemotherapy that was pushing the cells to one side into that aggressive state, and we wanted to stop that from happening? And so here's a, a fax experiment, and this is looking at the individual little cells. And so what you can see here is that these cells in grey are the non-aggressive cells. When we treat these non-aggressive cells with chemotherapy in red, you can see how they move upwards so they've moved up into that aggressive cell state. But now, when this means that the chemotherapy is pushing them into that aggressive state. Now, when we add in the drug sevoterinol, which is blocking the androgen receptor, this is in blue. You can see that adding that in at the same time as we give the chemotherapy completely stops these cells from moving into the aggressive state. So now, and we've, we've done this with many different types of chemotherapy, and you can see that every time in the blue that we add the sevoterinol to the different types of chemotherapy, it stops the cells from moving up. So this is really telling us um, two things, that we can get rid of those aggressive cells by using the androgen receptor inhibitors. We can also stop the chemotherapy from creating new ones. So the next thing we wanted to do was to see if this treatment actually works when we put it into preclinical models. And so what we do here is to take some aggressive breast cancer cells and we inject them into mice and tumours grow. And so what you're seeing here in this grey line is the growth of a tumour when it's not treated with anything. So they're very aggressive and they grow, grow very fast. When we look at the purple line here, you can see how the tumours respond to chemotherapy. 
So this gray bar is showing when we're treating with chemotherapy. So we treat for this time, then we stop, and then we treat again. And so what you can see in the curve is that the tumors respond. They start, um, they stop growing, they have a break, but when we come back in with the next round of chemotherapy, these tumors are already growing as if there's nothing there anymore. So they've already become completely resistant to the chemotherapy. When we add in, in blue, our drug Seveteranol, you can see that they respond beautifully with the chemotherapy, which is great. They continue to decline, but now when we add the next round of chemotherapy, these tumors are still sensitive. So this means that the drug is helping the tumor to stay sensitive to the chemotherapy, which is exactly what we were hoping to show. And so when we think about this back on the cancer cell landscape, we have chemotherapy that comes in and chemotherapy is very good at killing these cells that are in the non-aggressive state. But while we knew that when you treat with chemotherapy, the cells could escape to the other side, now by using Seveteranol, we're blocking those transitions so the cells can't move. And we also know that that Seveteranol is killing those existing aggressive cells. So together, the combination is much more effective at treating all the cells within the tumor, in the tumor and stopping the emergence of new resistant cell populations. So one of the other really important things about uh, treating patients and developing a clinical trial strategy is knowing which patients are going to respond to the therapy because these therapies don't always work for everyone, but sometimes they work exceptionally well for a smaller population of the people. And so this is where we start to think about precision medicine. How can we precisely pick the people that will respond to this specific therapy and make sure that that treatment will work for those people? And so in studying the androgen receptor, we were looking at the different tumor models we have. And here you can see um, some pictures of actual tumors. So these were grown in our animals, and all of these little blue dots are cells, and the brown staining is where we've stained for the cells that are expressing the androgen receptor. So, and this is just a, a zoomed in picture of that where you can see it at higher magnification. And what we see in the tumors is that one, there is a lot of androgen receptor being expressed within these triple negative breast cancers. You can also see that when there's a little small tumor, this is actually in a lung, so this, these cells have gone from the mammary fat pad, so from the breast and into the lung, they've spread. And you can see that they also express the androgen receptor because they're brown. And then when we look at these bigger tumors in the lung, we've got loads of androgen receptor. So what we were hoping was that when we treat these animals, that these patients who have the androgen receptor will also be able to respond. But one thing that we wanted to look at was can we use this staining, so the presence of the androgen receptor, to ask whether a patient will do poorly or do well with their cancer. And what we were able to see here in these curves, in the red line, we are just looking at patients that have high levels of the androgen receptor. And as you can see, each time the level of the androgen receptor gets higher, and higher and higher, the patients are doing worse. So if this line is heading down to the bottom, this means patients are dying. So what we were able to determine is that it actually seems to be true. The higher the levels of the androgen receptor that the patients have, the worse the prognosis. So together, um, and, and just to say, to think about this in the, the broader context, we looked at androgen receptor staining across other cancer types. And you can see here in endometrioid, ovarian, renal, liver, and glioblastoma, that there's presence of this androgen receptor in these tumors. So we're actually quite hopeful that if we think about this strategy that works so well in our preclinical models, models for breast cancer, that we might be able to extend this to many other cancer types as well. And so if we just think about all of that in context, what we've been able to establish here, and this has been um, a really a phenomenal collaboration with St. Vincent's Hospital, and this clinical trial has been led by Dr. Rachel Deere at the King Hong Cancer Centre. We've developed a clinical trial called Forecast. 
And Forecast is looking at the safety and the ability of this androgen receptor inhibitor, ceviteronol, to be combined with chemotherapy to improve the survival outcomes for breast cancer patients. And so what we see here is that this idea that normally, even though you have non-aggressive cells, in response to chemotherapy, they might move to this other side of the landscape where they have really high levels of the androgen receptor. So what we know and what we hope is that the chemotherapy will continue to kill these non-aggressive cells within the tumour. When we add in the ceviteronol for these patients, it's actually going to stop the cells from being able to move across this landscape. So we're going to lock them back over here where they're sensitive. And we also know that if there are already existing cells in this aggressive state within these tumours, that the ceviteronol is going to kill those as well. And so um, with that, I'd just like to thank all of the people who've been involved in this work and especially the development of our clinical trial. So all the members um, of my lab mentioned here, and I mentioned Bayer who drove this work, and collaborators abroad and close, thank you so much for listening today uh, and very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you so much, Christine. That was a really inspiring chat. And I've heard this research quite a bit lately because of you launching the clinical trial. But every time I see the results, I'm just astounded and I get goosebumps thinking about the, the impact that this could have. Um, while we wait for our audience members and those in the Zoom room to think about any questions they may have, I'm going to ask you a couple of my, my own. So. How long ago did you come up with this hypothesis of cancer cell states changing between aggressive and non-aggressive? So this has been an, an ongoing topic of research for me for about 10 years. So I started the work behind this when I was still in Boston at MIT studying how we can think about new ways to treat cancer. And during that time, I was able to show that the cancer cells are dynamically changing from one state to the other. So there was a, an understanding that those aggressive cells could um, create the non-aggressive cells, but we didn't know at the time that the non-aggressive cells can actually move back in the other direction. And so this was a really big change in the way we think about cancer cells being extremely dynamic, evolving, adapting all the time. And when I got back to the Garvin, one of the first questions we wanted to be able to answer is, well, can we turn all of this knowledge into a therapeutic? And so we worked really hard to try and understand pathways where there were already existing drugs. And this is how we came up with the androgen receptor. And the beauty of having existing drugs is that you generally know that they're safe. And what we're thinking about is how can we use a drug that's already out there for a new purpose? And so this enabled us to quite quickly then move this theory into the clinic. Fantastic. Everyone, we've got some questions coming in hard and fast from the Zoom room. So uh, the first one is, so would there be an extra cost to add to any chemo treatment? Uh, and, and presumably it can only be given whilst having chemotherapy. Yeah, so at the moment there's no cost associated with this because it's part of the clinical trial. So, and the way that we treat, the way the clinical trial is, has been developed is that the patients receive a week of the ceviteronol drug first before they start chemotherapy. And the idea behind that is that you treat the patient with the ceviteronol and that starts to move the cells back into the state where they're going to respond to the chemotherapy. So we have this lead in time of resensitizing, moving the cells back, and then we treat with the chemotherapy. And we keep the drug on throughout the chemotherapy treatment. So the patients continue to take ceviteronol and that's so that the chemotherapy, the cells don't have the chance to escape after they've been treated with the chemotherapy. Amazing. I've just had a little message that uh, we may need to get you to talk slightly louder. Forgive me for the people online um, having a little bit of difficulty hearing. Um, the next, uh, do we have anything in the room yet? Oh, we do. Fabulous. Okay, let's get some mics to those of you in the room. Hello, Brad. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. I was curious about ceviteronol, whether it was a drug that was used for something else or whether it was a drug that was modified 
used but then modified for this and maybe the history of where that's come from? Yeah, great question, Brad. Thanks. So we the, the drug was developed for this purpose to treat androgen receptor positive cancers. So prostate, maybe breast cancer. When the drug was used as a single agent, so just the sevoterinol alone, there was no impact on cancer progression. And so what we had in the, at simultaneously been working out was that the sevoterinol is fantastic at moving the cells from one state to the other, but alone it doesn't kill the cancer cells. And so we really needed that one-two punch, move the cells into one state, but then you still need the chemotherapy to actually kill the cells. And so that's the clinical trial that we have in development here at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre is using the sevoterinol in combination with chemotherapy for the first time. Thank you so much. We're going to go to a question from the Zoom room and then we'll come back to the live room as well. Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, the next question is, uh, well, first of all, a, a thank you. Thank you for that wonderful lecture and the good news about cancer treatment. Are you able to briefly talk about any possible side effects with this new treatment and when it is combined with chemotherapy? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So that's exactly the purpose of the clinical trial to check. First of all, we use a smaller number of patients to check that it's safe. And then once we've proven that it's safe, then we can expand out to a bigger cohort of patients. And so the side effects from the drug alone are fairly minimal. We've, um, in the previous work that was done with the drug as a single agent, the reports of fatigue, dizziness, uh, but no major adverse side effects. So um, for all intensive purposes, the, the drug is, is safe. So we'll see, we hope that that continues when we combine it with chemotherapy. Okay, so stay tuned. Our next live uh, question, thank you. Christine, it was wonderful, and very clearly presented for a lay audience. Um, I was virtually going to ask about side effects too, but following on from that, will you keep looking at long-term side effects? So sometimes, in my case, some severe side effects didn't happen until after five years after I'd finished treatment. So will the clinical trial keep a mentor of that? Yeah, so there is a set amount of time for follow-up. I think it's up to two years once the patients have finished the clinical trial. Um, so yes, definitely something that we keep in mind and, and are aware of. Mm, so sounds like some longitudinal studies could be very useful in the future. Great question. Uh, we've got a couple of individuals asking about the application of this treatment approach. Is it restricted to use in individuals with stage four triple negative breast cancer? Or what, what are the specific Yeah, so requirements? the requirements for going onto the clinical trial at the moment are patients that have metastatic breast cancer. So um, again, once we have been able to prove that this is safe, we're really... Um, excited and hopeful that we can move that into the earlier settings as well and make it available to more patients. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else waiting in the room? Fantastic. Hi, Christine. Um, you mentioned that high levels of cytoplasmic androgen receptor expression are associated with a worse prognosis. Did you use artificial intelligence as a tool to help you determine that or is that something that you do? So we actually do a lot of, um, we call it machine learning, just <laughs> um, it is the same thing, but it's actually a lot of machine learning training on a lot of data. So we work very closely with a group at Yale who help us to develop new algorithms to understand the complexity of what's going on in every individual cell all at the same time. But actually, in this instance, when we were looking at the cytoplasmic expression, so what we found uh, was purely an observation made in the lab that normally androgen receptor, it's a hormone receptor and it works in the nucleus. So inside the nucleus of the cell where it regulates different proteins that regulate the cell's ability to proliferate and to survive. And, but when there's no testosterone around, the receptor is actually held outside the nucleus. And because that's not thought to be where the androgen receptor has its primary function, it had been ignored. 
clinically and pathologically. And because we saw so much of it when we were staining our own samples of triple negative breast cancer, we asked our pathologist to score it. And of course, the first response we got was, we don't do that. <laughs> it's not what we, we only look at the nucleus. And we we're like, please, please, uh, can you quantitate the level in the cytoplasm? And as it turns out, the level of the receptor in the cytoplasm is what's predictive of poor prognosis. And when you only look at the content of the androgen receptor in the nucleus, it doesn't predict anything. And so that's really been something else that we're trying to drive into the clinic, this idea of being able to score or count the amount of androgen receptor and use that as a way of predicting how patients are going to do. So that's also a really new concept and something that we're trying to develop as we go through the clinical trial as well. Fantastic. I'll just go to a Zoom room question while we uh, get to our next live question. So uh, very exciting developments. Thank you so much. My question, how does severoterinol compare with other immunotherapy drugs like Keytruda? Are they similar uh, or is this even a better option? This is a different option. So the immunotherapies are a strategy to wake up the body's own immune system. So one of the things that a cancer will do is the cells work out a way to shut down the immune system. And so an immunotherapy will come in and it'll change the cells and stop them from suppressing and blocking the immune system. And so that makes your immune system attack the cancer cells better. And so what we also know is that this, those very aggressive cells that I showed you on the landscape, they're the cells that are the best at shutting down the immune system. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at throughout our clinical trial as well is that if we can make the, the cells move back to the other side of the landscape with severoterinol, that's also a place where they're not as good at suppressing the immune system. And so we might imagine in the future that you could combine a drug like severoterinol that puts the cells back in a state that's more sensitive to the immune system and to chemotherapy, and they might actually work in combination to get even better outcomes. So it's a great question, something that we're looking to explore further. Fantastic, thank you. And to the lovely lady in the front row, we'll just get you a microphone. Uh, say that I may have missed it. How would it be administered by orally or injection? And how rich do you have to be to have the treatment? Uh, so it's, it's an oral tablet that's taken three times daily. So fairly easy to take. Um, and as mentioned, at the moment, you, this is on clinical trials. So there's no cost to the patients for participating and getting access to the drug. Here, yeah, yeah. here. That's always a happy thing, isn't it? Um, so uh, a follow-on question here, which I think we've addressed, but I'll just double check that, that we've fully got this. So can it be used in metastatic patients who have also already been treated with chemotherapy? Absolutely. And so one of the, um, one of the ideas that we hope to be able to show in the clinical trial is that, um, sorry, let me back up. One of the reasons why patients become or are resistant to chemotherapy is because they have their cells in that orange cell state, so they're very aggressive. And so by pushing the cells back to the other side of the landscape, we are actually hoping that we can resensitize them to chemotherapy. And so absolutely, any people who have been treated with chemotherapy, the goal is that we can actually resensitize those patients to a different type of chemotherapy. And that's certainly how all of our modeling has been done in the lab. We always work with very aggressive types of tumors that are already insensitive to chemotherapy. Fantastic, thank you. And another question from Brad. Sorry, just another thought if I can. Um, if the trial goes well and it proves up, is there any prospect in the, f the long future that one could take the, the drug three times a day as a preventative for recurrence um, after treatment of initial cancer rather than metastatic. Yes. And so, um, and this, we can think about other drugs that are used like that. So for example, tamoxifen for estrogen receptor positive cancers. Um, it's very similar in concept there. So patients that are driven by estrogen, so this is not testosterone as we think in this case of triple negative, 
they're driven by estrogen. So if you go on long-term tamoxifen treatment to, to block estrogen receptor, it can prevent recurrence. So we actually, um, even in the clinical trial that was done in the US for the severoteranol as a single agent, there were actually some patients that responded. So we actually still have a couple of patients who are on long-term severoteranol treatment for exactly that reason. Excellent question, Brad. And indeed, somebody else in the in the Zoom room has just asked, as you were putting your hand up, asked the exact same question. So I think that kind of prophylactic preventative approach is something that's really exciting for the future. A couple of questions coming through here about access um, and, uh, you know, criteria requirements. I'm guessing it's probably best that we promote the precise channel in the feedback email that we'll be sharing following today. Um, but one question that probably would be useful to address is, uh, you know, where where is the clinical trial taking place in Vincent's Garden? Um, and uh, can it be taken orally? Yes, I think we have agreed that. Um, but can it be taken through the clinic where you have already received your prior treatment? So the only... The only way to get access to the drug at the moment is through the clinical trial and it's being used and that's in combination with um, chemotherapy. So they would need to come to, to the St. Vincent's, Vincent's campus. Yep, okay. fantastic. We're very friendly here though, so please, please do come along. Um, okay, we, I think we had another question in the room. Thank you. Uh, chemotherapy seems to be a bit of a villain in a way here in the sense that I think you, you mentioned that it contributes to pushing um, non-aggressive cells to become aggressive. And then you also mentioned, uh, and I'm not quite sure of the context, that you were hoping to be able to resensitize um, the aggressive cells, I think, to chemotherapy treatment. But my question really is, are there different types of chemotherapy treatment? And if so, have they, has the question been addressed, could we use different types of chemotherapy to, so it doesn't do these? Yeah, things? awesome. So, so many questions in there. So the first part, uh, just to reiterate that chemo, when chemotherapy works, and it often does, it works very well. So this is not the case in all cases. So chemotherapy is still wonderful despite all of the terrible side effects. Um, when the tumour is able to change cell states, this is where we see that, and that, that chemotherapy could be a problem. But now this is what we think we have a solution to. So um, for example, in triple negative breast cancer, about two thirds of patients respond really well to chemotherapy and their disease never comes back and that's the end of it. But there's one third of patients where chemotherapy works a little bit, but it doesn't get rid of everything. And this is where, when it comes back, the cells have become resistant. And so our research has shown in our models that we can take that resistant disease and we can actually resensitize. It does require the tumor to have some sensitivity to the chemotherapy. And so this is where changing patients from one chemotherapy that they've had before where they became resistant to a new one, but combining it with severoteranol is where we could have the most outstanding effects. But having said that, we can also use the same chemotherapy according to our experimental models. So if a patient has become or been treated with paclitaxel or docetaxel, we can still use that again, but in combination with the severoteranol, and we hope that we can still resensitize them because we're moving the cells into a different state. These are really hard and difficult questions to answer yet, but this is exactly what the clinical trials set up to do. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so stay tuned for the outcomes from the clinical trial. Um, a great question here from the Zoom room. Why is it the androgen receptor affected by testosterone and not estrogen? Uh, so the, the hormone receptors, um, there are lots of different types of receptors in our body and all of them have quite specific, we call them ligands that can activate them. And so there has to be a, a level of specificity in the body. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't function as humans, right? Because anything could activate anything. So there is some, a level of 
um, specificity about those interactions. Um, to add a little bit more detail though, it can actually occur that the androgen receptor, once it's activated by its own ligand, can bind to similar places in the DNA that the estrogen receptor would. So there is a little bit of cross reactivity there. And it's a really interesting question because um, in an estrogen receptor positive tumor type, we don't believe that this androgen receptor inhibition would have the same effect because the androgen receptor and estrogen receptor work differently when they're in the same cell. So triple negative breast cancer does not have the estrogen receptor to worry about. So this is, um, and it's the same as prostate cancer uh, and same as um, some of those other cancers I mentioned before, glioblastoma, we're not thinking about the role of estrogen receptor in those contexts. But um, biology is complex. We don't have the answers to all of those those questions yet. But the, that idea would be that this is something specific for um, androgen receptor positive tumors that do not have estrogen receptor actively driving the cancer. Amazing. I'm going to ask everyone to give a round of applause for Christine, please, um, here in the room and in the Zoom room. Just. Fantastic, and we cannot wait to see the outcomes of this clinical trial and to, to have you back here at the right time to tell us to tell it how it's gone. Uh, for those of you here and in the Zoom room who would like more information either about Christine's research or about potential access to the clinical trial, we will be sharing with all of you a follow-up email um, for those of you who, whom we have details for. Uh, if we don't have your details, please do leave them with us before you head off uh, and we'll provide all of the information there to access um, the, the, the hotline for potential access to the trial, to getting more information on Christine's work or any of the work that we do at the Garvin Institute. We'll also be including a uh, survey there for, for your full and frank feedback. We are still um, uh, learning how to deal in this hybrid world, having people in real life and in the Zoom room. So we really welcome all of your feedback on how we can do better to, to communicate with you and to share the incredible research of Christine and, and her peers and colleagues. Um, gosh, thank you. I think we all feel very inspired, very excited for the future. One final question to close. Assuming you ever have any spare time, what, what do you do? What are your hobbies? Uh, uh, house cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> um, family. I think we have uh, three kids and spend most of our time, spare time, <laughs> trying to spend time with them and just enjoy life. Mm. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. And this, the recording of this session will also be shared um, as a follow-up in the email so that if you want to watch it again or share it with friends and family, please do. And, and a huge thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, we're so grateful to have our Garvin family. You really make this place a very special place. And it's always an honour to have you here uh, in person and, and in the Zoom room. So thanks, everyone. And we hope to see you again very soon.